Good morning. Pomp, circumstance and plenty of politics too. One transfer of power. Images to last the ages. But swap the cloaks and baubles for the ballot box and are we living through another one? <laughs> Labour is winning this race, taking councils and seats all over England. <laughs> Sir Keir Starmer claimed this. Make no mistake, this means that we are on course for a Labour majority at the next election. Three, two, one. The Lib Dems scooping up seats as well, many more than they'd hoped. The Greens also profiting at Tory failures. So a lonely looking Prime Minister, the morning after a dreadful night. What people want us to do is focus on their priorities. Halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, cutting waiting lists and stopping the boats. Those are the country's priorities. Confirmation at the real polls in town after town that the Conservatives are in deep, deep trouble. A tall order to avoid Rishi Sunak becoming the next one to join this procession. So this morning, we have one big question. What comes next? And after all those losses, the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, has perhaps the unenviable job of representing the Conservatives this morning. A rather chipper Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, joins us for Labour. And New Zealand's Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, raced here from the Abbey yesterday to talk royals, reparations, and believe it or not, sausage rolls. More on that later. But with me at the desk, a grinning Ed Davey, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, fresh from election success, the Mirror editor, Alison Phillips, and Cambridge professor, Jason Arday. Morning, morning. A very warm welcome. Now, we might not have any cloaks or crowns or pomp or pageantry actually here in the studio, but we will have a lot of fun and we can show you all of that because it is, no surprise, all over every single front page. There you have it, the Sunday Times, the Mirror and on the front of the Mail on Sunday, they're claiming that the King said the look that says Darling, it was a triumph. Who knows what he was actually saying? Um, another set of papers, Scotland on Sunday, The Observer and Sunday <coughs> Express saying happy and glorious. And we can show you this is how Buckingham Palace looks this morning. It does look a little bit morning after the night before, but nice pictures to look at all the same. A very warm welcome to my panel. Thanks all for being with us. Now, Alison, you were there yesterday. What will stay with you from it, do you think? Um, this sounds really silly, but the, the glitteriness of the crowns was the most shocking of the whole thing. They sparkled and there was a... So I think there was that, and I think there was the, the role that the children played was really beautiful. And then I think the other thing is the, the real seriousness behind it all, in that we've seen, um, we've seen weddings, which are really joyful. We've seen the Queen's funeral, which was terribly sad. But this was something unlike anything else any of us have seen before. But there was a real seriousness and a real relig religiousness about it, which was mm. quite unusual. And did that surprise you, actually? It really did, and it was very much the Church of England. Uh -huh. This, I mean, it was, in many ways, sort of quite a diverse event, mm -hmm. but at the bottom line was this was a Church of England, this was between one man and his God. Could it really be, then, a sort of diverse event? I mean, we know, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Palace said they were trying very hard to make it more inclusive and to make it... Um, less refined in a way to bring everybody into it. But Jason, when you were watching it, did you feel that? Look, I think on the face of it, there were a lot of pointers or markers that demonstrated um, diversity and showed a significant difference in terms of what's happened over the last 70 years in terms of the coronation in 1953 and where we are in 2000 and 2023. But what I would say is that that in of itself, as Alison's pointed to, was a very Christian service, mm -hmm. um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But in terms of the multi-faith aspect and the hyper diversity that we would have liked to have seen across the intersect within society, mm -hmm. I think that it didn't actually present that in reality. And it's easy also to get carried away because the images are so wonderful and there were people that went to the mall to celebrate, but there were also people who went to go and protest. And at a protest in London's Trafalgar Square, it appears that pe some people were actually arrested for quite peaceful protest. Um, do you think that that was appropriate? 
I mean, in terms of the appropriacy of it, I, I think no. I, I think what we are beginning to see is an infringement on our ability to have free speech. And I think that it was a peaceful protest. And I think, to be quite honest, and without surprise, I, I think the police's reaction um, to that particular situation was pretty heavy handed and rather unnecessary, in my belief. Ed, what did you make of that? Well, listen, the, the tradition of the coronation was fantastic, and we all rejoice to that uh, and as monarchists we celebrated that uh, that's a British tradition mm -hmm. but there's also another British tradition the right to protest uh, and uh, we don't want that to be lost um, I don't know the exact reasons why the sure. police uh, arrested those people and I'm not we think we should need some clarification on that I think that's important but I actually hold the government responsible the Conservative government have been passing uh, legislation to clamp down on protest to that, that breached British traditions of civil liberties mm. and I think the Conservatives have got a lot to answer for. Okay well you were at the coronation as well yesterday and I think we can show viewers a, a shot of you sitting chatting to Keir Starmer in the pews of Westminster Abbey maybe the picture will hopefully come up in a minute um, I just wonder what were you two talking about? We're talking about the coronation uh, and the music, I mean, the music was fantastic. I mean, when Sir Bryn Turfield uh, sang Kyrie Eleison, yeah. and I was right, almost next, could almost touch him, he was singing Kyrie Eleison in Welsh for the first time ever. It was an amazing event. So there was a lot to discuss. And uh, yeah, we did talk about the local elections as well. We were both quite pleased. Well, we might ask you a bit more about that a bit later on. Thank you, all three of you, for now. Stay with us, there's plenty ahead. Now, by early Friday morning, with losses stacking up, it was obvious the Tories were having a very bad night. The Prime Minister was asked about what was happening at Tory HQ. Actually, we're making progress in key election battlegrounds like Peterborough, Bassetlaw, Sandwell. But the message I am hearing from people tonight is that they want us to focus on their priorities and they want us to deliver for them. And that's about halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, cutting waiting lists and stopping the boats. When he says progress there, let's talk about what he actually meant. The Tories added one councillor in Peterborough, four in Bassett Law and two in Sandwell and none of those councils are under Conservative control. And the results got worse for the party throughout the day. In the end, the Conservatives lost more than a thousand seats. That was at the worst end of expectations. Labour won an extra 500, the Lib Dems more than 400 and the Greens almost 250. Good performances all round for those three. Well, the Culture Secretary, Cabinet Minister, Lucy Fraser, joins us this morning. Welcome. It's great to have you here for the first time. Um, we've just heard Rishi Sunak there responding to really heavy losses by just repeating his five pledges that he makes again and again. Does he get the scale of the problem you have? I think so. I think he also said, you know, recognising it's so sad uh, to see so many councillors lose whatever party they're from, hardworking councillors across the country. I think we absolutely recognise uh, that we need to take action and deliver. But let's just look at the context in which those local elections took place. We've been in power for 13 years. We've just come out of a pandemic that's affected everybody's life and is affecting the cost of living. We're still at war in Ukraine and supporting Ukraine. Uh, and so, you know, the, the Prime Minister is focusing quite rightly on what he's heard over the last six months, what I've heard on the doorstep over the last six months about what people want us to deliver. Mm -hmm. And that's what people want us to deliver. They want us to to cut inflation but and do those other things that he talked about. Except that those are the same things that he's been saying for months and months and months. And we saw very clearly voters around the country, no doubt many viewers this morning, saying, you know what, we don't buy it, we reject that, we don't want it. Well, what the voters need to see is us deliver on those priorities. So we've started on inflation because inflation is coming down. Uh, what I've heard on the doorstep, and uh, you will so know I've been knocking on doors. 10% so inflation. Yeah, but we are seeing that it's on track to come down and what we need to do is deliver on those things and I think when people see us delivering then we will regain the trust uh, in the British people but you can also say because you've talked about you know the great successes of Labour and the Lib Dems uh, they didn't actually do as well as the polls had suggested and we'll, talk, and we'll talk to them about their performance later but we're beginning by talking to you about your performance it kind of sounds like you're not really going to change anything you're doing so what you're saying is what we need to do is keep the promises that we've made when you lose more than a thousand councillors isn't it a moment to reflect on it a bit more than that, rather than just saying, uh, yes, well, here are the five things we promised in January and we hope if we keep saying them, then everything will be OK? Uh, we absolutely need to reflect. I think Rishi's only been the Prime Minister 
for six months. And I think yeah, it's not five minutes, it's six months. It's not five minutes, seven. but these are huge challenges, Laura. They are challenges that countries are facing internationally. I mean, I must say, having knocked on doors throughout the uh, local election campaign, I have seen a change in mood of the British people, you know, quite uh, very difficult at the beginning of the campaign, but slowly beginning to give uh, the government and Rishi credit. And, and you giving you credit by kicking out more than a thousand of your councillors. No, it was difficult. I'm not going to pretend that wasn't a difficult result, but you mentioned a couple of of, of areas, some of those close to me, Peterborough, uh, close to me, you know, Fenland, close to me, took, uh, had, had successes. I was uh, told, you know, I was a Lib Dem target. Uh, we held the council. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are some councils up and down the country that, that have done okay. I want to play you and our viewers this morning what some of your councillors were saying to us on election night around the country. Let's have a listen to them. The Prime Minister and Chancellor and the rest of the government need to uh, bringing out a positive agenda that people are prepared to, to support. It was all to do with government issues. I mean, locally we were getting very positive feedback, but what people had concerns with cost of living, the fuel, the prices, the mortgage, immigration, and they feel like the government isn't actually on their side, and I'm saying that as a Conservative. We have done a good job. We have really looked after our electorate. We're building more and more affordable homes. We've built council houses. Where we're really trying to look after everyone in our district. But unfortunately, uh, on a national level, we've been let down. You've let down your councillors around the country. One of them said, I'm a Conservative, and it does, voters don't think the government's on their side. We need to do more. We need to deliver. We are delivering. Uh, and uh, I mean, I just come back to my local council. You know, we were delighted on election night. We held the council I'm in very difficult you about the, circumstances. The national picture. We, we, and well, it's grim and people are not convinced that Rishi Suna is the man who can actually keep the promises that he makes. Well, I have seen, uh, I've seen in Cabinet, I worked with him for a year in the Treasury, and I've seen he's a man capable of delivering, and he is delivering. We talked about inflation, cutting the debt. We've seen action on small boats, uh, and we've seen a, a cut in uh, waiting lists in relation to the NHS. But I do well, want to come back. There's plenty of waiting lists I do going want the wrong to come way, back to the know. other parties, because in order for Labour to win uh, at the general election, historically, they would have had to have gained, you know, be uh, ahead by and 30. We will, can I we just will make speak this to point? Labour later in the to programme? About points their above. performance, but I'm asking you about what's going on with the Conservatives. And I think listening to you this morning, listening to the Prime Minister on Friday morning, I just wonder if a lot of viewers will think they don't get our mood, they don't get what's going on in the country. People have been turning away from you in significant number. I think, uh, well, I think that would be totally wrong if they thought that. We have heard what people's concerns are. So, what are you going to change? We are listening. We are going to. I, when I knock on doors, the thing that people care about most at the moment is how they are going to cope uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with the cost of living. And that's why we've put in £97 billion. You know, the average person is getting uh, help of around £3,000. It's still challenging, I know it is, but we are listening and those are the major things that we are doing. And I do think, um, because I did see a shift in the course of my campaign, I did see a shift where people are now thinking that we are listening to them, but there is absolute, I'm not going to pretend there isn't more to do, there is, we need to deliver on, on what we've said we're going to do. And then I think, and then we, I think we earn the trust of the confidence of, of the people um, to okay, well, let's let's move on. Yesterday, of course, was a huge event for the country, the coronation. Um, and yet we did see that there were pockets of protest and what appears to have been a peaceful protest. Some arrests were made. Um, Ed Davies just has said to us he thinks that you have changed the atmosphere, that you are trying to clamp down on perfectly legitimate protests. What do you say to that? Well, can I first just start by saying what an amazing event it was. You know, Britain on the world stage, huge advert for Global Britain. And I think it was a phenomenal event of which I was incredibly proud to be a part of and proud to be British. And I spoke to a number of people who, who said the same thing. So um, I think a fantastic event. Look, this right to protest is really important. We live in a democracy and it's really important 
uh, that people feel a right, a right to be heard and, and are heard. But what we've seen uh, over the last uh, few years is a change in tactics of protesters. We've seen them stopping people going about their day-to-day -day business, whether that's uh, going to school, being able to go to hospital, being able to go to work, being able to commute and go on motorways. And I think what we've needed to do is redress that balance because people also have a right to live their day-to-day -day lives. And that's what we've done is brought in legislation uh, to redress that balance and but get I, the right balance. But, but are you concerned, you know, as a Conservative, and it's an important political pr tradition in this country that people have the right to protest, are you concerned that sometimes the balance might be wrong in that because it's one thing causing disruption like some protests that we've seen in the last couple of years that you've referenced there but some activists and campaigners and the liberal democrats and some other politicians worry that actually the general right to protest is being eroded uh, well, I regularly see protests. I mean, obviously, I work in the Houses of Parliament and I walk through a protest uh, or two or maybe three every day uh, along uh, Parliament. I think that is a fundamental right. We do need to make sure we get that balance right. And I do think it was right to bring in legislation. The police asked us for more powers. Mm -hmm. People's day-to-day -day lives were being affected. And I think it's absolutely right that we stand up for those people who want to go about their daily business. And you back the action the police took yesterday? So the police, as you know, Laura, are operationally independent uh, and they will have made tough calls yesterday. I mean, you will have seen uh, that there were large protests taking place. The police were aware of those protests and they let them happen. Mm -hmm. But they will have made operational decisions on a case by case basis as to what steps they should have taken. And I know that they took into account and I think they were quite right to take into account the context of the event as a as a whole. We were on the global stage. There were 200 foreign dignitaries in the UK, in London, at an event. Uh, millions of people uh, watching, hundreds of thousands of people at the scene. I mm. think it was really important that they took that into account okay. when take, making their decisions. OK, now it's the first time you've come in here as Culture Secretary, so we want to do a bit of a sort of quick fire on the things that are yes. in your entry because yes. there is a lot there and you've not been in the job for long. So let's start with sports. Now, are you comfortable with foreign groups like the Qataris buying Manchester United? Oh, so you will know one of the first things that I did uh, as Culture Secretary, so three weeks into the job, was uh, publish a white paper on football regulation. Mm -hmm. And it is really important that uh, we ensure that food, football clubs mm -hmm. are financially sustainable mm -hmm. because fans uh, are really important and unfortunately fans are picking up the pieces. Mm -hmm. So we've brought in uh, uh, regulations which will maintain the financial stability of the clubs. You specifically asked me about foreign clubs. Mm -hmm. We're not bringing any in particular rules about foreign ownership versus British ownership. What we are doing is ensuring that whoever owns a club, mm -hmm. they are financially stable uh, and, and we are bringing in owners and directors yep. tests to ensure uh, that fans are protected. So would you be comfortable then with a Qatari consortium buying Man U? That sounds like a yes. Uh, well, that we're not bringing any particular rules in relation to foreign ownership. OK, what about the BBC licence fee then? One of your predecessors, Nadine Dorries, said the current settlement would be the last. So in other words, licence fees on the way out. Do you agree? I think the BBC is a phenomenal British institution. So I mentioned, you know, the 200 dignitaries uh, that came over over the weekend and mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to speak to many of them uh, who talk about uh, uh, the soft power of the UK. Mm -hmm. That means, you know, recognising our values uh, overseas. And the BBC is part of that. So should the licence fee stay then? We do need to look at, and we're reviewing, as you all know, we're reviewing mm -hmm. the charter and mm -hmm. we will be looking at the licence fee. But and the licence fee is one of that. And I do think we need to think about the way the BBC it is funded, but it is important that it gets the resources that it needs in able to continue to be the fantastic institution that but it is. But are you disagreeing then with Nadine Dorries, who said very clearly, as Culture Secretary, you're now Culture Secretary, she said the last, the licence fee settlement as it stands would be the last. In other words, the licence fee firmly, in her view, was on the way out. Is that your view? Well, we are reviewing the licence fee. I've started that review. I'll be listening to a, a number of people, including the BBC. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it will have to look very closely at its funding arrangement. We will be looking very closely at its funding arrangement. Um, and uh, that is something that we will be looking at very seriously in due course. But I'm just trying to understand, is it your instinct that basically, therefore, the licence fee should go ultimately? Well, I, I know you want to press me, and I've just said that we are starting that process, and I do think it's really important mm. that the BBC gets this funding, but uh, I do think it might need to look at a variety of sources uh, for its funding, but 
I'm starting that review at the moment. I don't want to prejudge that. But it's so a variety of sources. What do you mean by that? Well, I've just started this review. I'm very happy to come on in the future to discuss it. I'd like to ensure the BBC is properly funded. The licence fee isn't the only way. OK, now we're in a few minutes, we're going to hear from the Prime Minister of New Zealand. One of the interesting things we talked about him was the demand from Indigenous peoples in New Zealand and also from other parts of the world that their artefacts should be returned to them from mm. British museums. Should museums in this country give artefacts back if they're asked? Uh, well, the position in relation to... Uh, we, we hold a number of uh, the world's uh, uh, artefacts here in the UK. I was at the British Museum only about two weeks ago, seeing the fantastic displays uh, that we have. The world comes to see them. The British Museum mm -hmm. uh, is in... Uh, uh, one in five people who come to the UK mm -hmm. go to the British uh, Museum uh, to see the world's objects. Uh, those items are owned by the British Museum, by the trustees of the British Museum, and uh, the law states that they should not be returned. So, so they should not be returned? Uh, well, uh, the, the law states we have no current plan to change the law. And will the Greeks ever get the Parthenon marbles back? Well, as I stated, we have no current plans to change the laws, and uh, the, those are legally owned by the trustees of the British Museum. OK, Lucy Fraser, Culture Secretary, great Thank to have you, you with us in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Now, we hadn't seen one for 70 years. And when Coronation Day came, there was plenty to see. Cloaks, crowns, crowds and the rest. And this, the moment of history. Then, proclamation. God save the king! God save the king! And a bit later, fun and celebration. God save Leaders from all over the world got a golden ticket. Those with Commonwealth connections, of course, here too. One of them was New Zealand's new Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins. And he came to talk to us straight after the service. Well, it's just a huge honour to be part of something that's so historically significant um, for so many people. It's the first time in our lifetimes that we've seen the British Crown um, change and there'd be a coronation of a new monarch. And what was the atmosphere like in the Abbey? You know, you were there, most of us were watching it on TV, but what was in the air? It was a really nice feel in the, in the Abbey. I think everyone was, uh, was being very dignified and restrained and nobody wanted to make a mistake. Um, <laughs> but, but actually, you know, just a, a real feeling of goodwill and excitement about the fact that something, you know, that was very, you know, historically significant was taking place. Now, you met King Charles this week, but you've just taken over in January from Jacinda Ardern. When you met the king, did he have any advice about taking over from a world famous woman? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't say that that was something that we talked about, but we did, we did have a very warm conversation. Can you tell us what he did say to you? We talked a lot about um, the flooding and the cyclones that have uh, happened in New Zealand since in the first part of this year um, and you know, how the recovery efforts were going. And also, of course, that led, led to a conversation around climate change. And um, you know, those, are those are issues that are near and dear to the hearts of many members of, of the royal family. Now, you've just been at the ceremony, met the king, but you've been a Republican, I think, all your life. You don't think the monarchy should exist? Well, so I, 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 it's not that I didn't, don't think the monarchy should exist. I describe myself as a technical Republican. Okay. So if you were going to you know, write a constitution for New Zealand, who would be the head of state? In my, my mind, it would be uh, nice to have someone who is in New Zealand to be uh, head of state. Having said that, we, like the UK, have an unwritten constitution. And as soon as you start making a fundamental decision like having a different head of state, it raises a whole lot of other constitutional questions as well. And the system that we've got actually works quite well at the moment. Um, you know, the, to all intents and purposes, other than on ceremonial, uh, ceremonial occasions, the role of the king or the monarch is actually performed by a governor general who is based in New Zealand. And so what we have at the moment you know, it, it wouldn't be what I would design if we were designing the system from scratch, um, but actually it's working OK. And there isn't a groundswell of support amongst New Zealanders to, to, to ask for change. That's interesting. Do you think that New Zealand might become a republic in your lifetime? I think it will happen eventually. But 
you know, there, there have obviously been some recent opportunities with mm. the, the passing of the Queen, for example, would have been an opportunity if New Zealanders wanted to say, hey, now, now we think now's the time to have the debate. Mm. There hasn't been a groundswell of support for even having a debate. So, uh, you know, I guess I think a lot of New Zealanders take the view if it's not broken, don't try and fix it. And, it, and not, it's working OK. But that's not your view. Your view is you would rather that the link was phased out. Oh, look, like I said, if, if I was designing a system, I, this wouldn't be the system that I was going to design. But um, I, don't, I also don't think it's a pressing priority at the moment. There's a lot happening, mm. and uh, and this isn't this isn't at the top of the list. Did you swear allegiance to the king at the ceremony? I did at the ceremony, and I also did when I was sworn in as prime minister. Because under our oaths and affirmations in New Zealand, when you take on a, a, a political role, a publicly elected role, whether it's as a member of parliament, as a minister, or as prime minister, you swear allegiance to previously Queen Elizabeth II. Now mm -hmm. you swear allegiance to King Charles III. Does it feel weird to you to have to do that? Um, the king is our head of state, so uh, and, as, and until New Zealanders make the view, um, you know, take the view that that should change, um, I have I don't have any hesitation in doing that because ultimately the king is our head of state, and uh, I do that in the service of the people of New Zealand. Now, one of the interesting things about this moment of change is there's a lot more conversation in this country and other countries about the UK's past, and some of the indigenous leaders from your country have signed an open letter to King Charles asking for an apology, asking for reparations, an apology for colonialism and slavery. Do you think the British monarchy should apologise for past mistakes? Well, in, in instances where a, a wrong has been established and, it's been, you know, and, a, and a redress has been agreed, an apology from the Crown, in some cases delivered by the Crown, mm. um, has been included within that. I don't think you, you can do that um, in a non-specific way. I actually think it's more important and more meaningful mm. if you're actually looking at specific harm done to specific groups of people. And we've got a process in New Zealand. To, uh, the mm. Treaty of Waitangi is, was our founding document as a country. And we've got a process for reconciling breaches of the Treaty of Waitangi, and there were plenty of them. Mm. And over time, you know, we're working through a process. It's taken several decades, and we're not finished yet. But we do work through identifying what those breaches were, um, what the harm caused by them was, a actually creating a record of that. And in many cases, the redress includes a, a full apology, for, mm. and, and that can come from the Crown. And it's interesting, in New Zealand, you have, you know, taken this head on, had this big process, do you think it would be good for the UK to follow that example? I think really every country's got to make their own judgments about that and it's not really appropriate for me as a leader of New Zealand to, mm. to tell other countries what they should do. But I would speak very positively about our experience. It hasn't been easy um, and there's no doubt when you, when you look into the past and you delve into the past and you identify what's happened, in many cases horrific and horrible things have happened, um, actually making a record of that and then, and then, and then acknowledging it and finding a way of, of providing some redress, um, I think that it's a very, very powerful thing. And, uh, it, but it isn't easy and it won't be quick. So any other countries who are looking at doing this, you know, one of my messages is you have to do it appropriately and you have to, you have to approach it very openly and you won't always get it right either. Mm. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's always a work in progress. But if it was right for the New Zealand government to do it, then would it be right, wouldn't it be right for King Charles to do it? Like I said, it's, other countries, you know, it, it's really a matter for the governments of other countries to determine what's appropriate in their context. And these issues are often tricky and just as you were leaving to come here, one of your own ministers quit to join the Maori party she said she wanted to join a political movement that was unapologetic about um, Maori political involvement. Do you think your parties failed to represent the cause, therefore? No, I don't. I think, um, you know, Maori New Zealanders don't all have one view politically. Mm. But, you know, like every section of the population, every ethnicity, they'll have a variety of different views. Mm. And um, you'll see that represented in our parliament. We have Maori members of parliament in most political parties. Mm. Um, and I think that's a welcome thing. It's, it, that, it, it suggests that the diversity of our parliament is ensuring that we have what we aspire to have, which is a true House of Representatives. She obviously felt, though, that your party was not representing that cause properly. Yeah, and look, I, I haven't had the opportunity to speak with her about that, so I won't speak on her behalf. Obviously, I'm, I'm disappointed by that, but um, I know that our Māori members of parliament in the Labour Party play a really important role within our team, and they, they are outspoken on issues mm. affecting Māori members of our community. There's also been a big change in this country, obviously, with us leaving the European Union, and you know, there's a big conversation in this country about 
about whether or not Brexit has damaged the standing of the UK around the world. Do you think it has? Uh, we obviously welcome the opportunity to, to trade more with the United Kingdom mm -hmm. and uh, the, the opportunity for us to negotiate and enter into a free trade agreement with the UK post-Brexit, which is what we've been able to do, is something that we welcome. Ultimately, Brexit's really a matter for, for the UK government and the people of the UK, um, but we are excited by the opportunity to increase our trade with the UK. Who got the better deal in the trade agreement? I think all trade agreements, you, you've got to make sure that both sides are getting something out of it, and I think that that's the case with this one. Is it? If you look at the estimates of how much both sides will get from it, the estimated impact on UK GDP is about 0.01%, I think, and for you it's 0.35%. It's a bit one-sided, isn't it? Well, the, the UK, of course, is a much, much larger economy than New Zealand, so a single trade agreement is going to, by definition, make up a smaller contribution of their GDP. What? We're a very small trading nation, and, uh, and, and our export industries, particularly in some of the areas where uh, the, the, the trade agreement covers, um, they're a very big part of our economy, so I don't think it's a, I think as a percentage of GDP, it's probably not a fair comparison. Some of our farmers aren't that happy though, and I just want to read you how also some of the reporting of this deal was represented in New Zealand. Um, a reporter by News Hub in New Zealand when the deal was struck said, a world away from rejoicing Kiwi farmers, their well-wearing counterparts in the UK feel as though they're the sacrificial lambs. I, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think if you look at our primary sectors, for example, there's a seasonal aspect to, the, to this, mm. which is quite complementary. Um, so I, I think uh, there's, there's certainly plenty in the deal for both sides. What would you say to a grumpy farmer in the UK, though, who thinks that New Zealand cleverly pulled one over on the UK? Oh, I, don't, I don't think that that's true. You sure? Absolutely. <laughs> Members of the audience might not know, but you are a huge fan of sausage rolls. This is one of the things that you are known for. Now, sausage rolls are also very, very popular in the United Kingdom. And you were presented with a platter of them by Rishi Sunak. And King Charles apparently also gave you a tray of sausage rolls. Um, did you ever think that your career in politics in New Zealand would result in the King of the United Kingdom giving you a platter of mini sausage rolls. I have to say that there have been some surreal moments in the past week for a, a boy who grew up in the working class suburbs of Lower Hutt. Um, becoming Prime Minister of New Zealand was a pretty big honour. Obviously coming all the way around here to this side of the world and to meet with all of the people who I've met with in the, in the last week, it is, uh, you know, it, it, is a, it, is, it has been quite uh, significant here. Yeah. But the sausage roll moment is pretty weird, right? The sausage roll moment is really cool, actually. Word got round at home, and I get a lot of sausage rolls wherever I go at, at home in New Zealand at the moment. But to be presented them by the King and by the Prime Minister of the UK, uh, that's next level. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to ask this finally. Whose sausage rolls are better? Uh, now I've I would been make asked a that. strong case for the UK, obviously, but what's your view? Well, I've been asked whether the King's sausage rolls or the Prime Minister's were better, and I'm not going to get into that because I think that would be dangerous territory for me. But... Uh, uh, look, I, I, it, it depends. You, you know, there's a lot that goes into a good sausage roll. You've got to get the right mix of meat and pastry. And so far, though, for the ones that you've tasted here while you've been here, have they been as good as the ones at home? They've been pretty good. They've been up there. Yeah. Chris Hipkins, Prime Minister of New Zealand, thank you very much indeed for coming into the studio. Thank you. And well, we thought our politics was sometimes a bit strange. There we go. Chris Hipkins, the new Prime Minister of New Zealand and sausage roll fan. Now, I'm sure there were plenty of sausage rolls consumed yesterday and probably plenty more today on the way. Here is Tina Dehaley from Morecambe with what's coming up later today on BBC One. Join us this afternoon as we celebrate the coronation at street parties and community events across the UK. I'll be here in the Lancashire seaside town of Morecambe, which is hoping to break the record for the biggest street party for the coronation in the world. From Bude in Cornwall to Westray in Orkney and Eskillid in Northern Ireland to Cowbridge in Wales and more. We'll be live with those coming together to enjoy the bank holiday weekend. That's this afternoon from 12.30 on BBC One and on BBC iPlayer. OK, make sure that you stay tuned for that a bit later on, sausage roll or not. Now, there were some really interesting things in that conversation with Chris Hipkins, I thought, and New Zealand, he told us, has sort of confronted some of the things that went wrong in its past. And on that question of reparations, he was careful to say, I'm not going to tell the UK what to do, but I speak of it very positively. Um, Jason, do you think some sort of reparation process or maybe even an apology from the government or the royal family 
is the kind of course that people should be thinking about now because of slavery and some of the things that happened during the empire period? I think so, Laura. And what kind of Chris um, beautifully articulated was the importance of having a treaty that actually puts that in place, you know, for that, um, I guess, um, apology one to be in place and to the kind of landscape to recognise the harm that was caused to the indigenous people of New Zealand. We don't have something similar within the UK context. And also one thing that's really interesting that King Charles himself has spoke about his deeply profound sorrow in terms of the role that the monarchy played or its ties to slavery and has actually given his backing towards um, research um, that will look into the monarchy's links into the slave trade. And do you think it would actually make a difference to some of the relations inside the UK, um, you know, relations, community relations, or if we think about what happened more, much more recently than any of thing that happened during the period of empire with Windrush, for example, do you think that if the king came out explicitly and did this kind of thing, it would make a difference? I think when we think about monarchy and we think about how we modernise the monarchy and how the monarchy should be more reflective of a 21st century multi-ethnic um, Britain, I think one of the things that would go a long way mm. to kind of furnishing that is kind of really thinking about one, the language that's used with those communities and two, that apology that is so sought after because there is kind of an ambivalence to Britain's colonial past and in some respects there can almost be a celebration of that empirical rule which was deeply harmful to black and ethnic minority people historically. We saw yesterday and we touched on at the beginning that in the ceremony you know there had been effort to make it look more diverse and more inclusive than the one that happened 70 years ago you know among all those extraordinary images from the Abbey yesterday but Alison do you think that there could be a sort of explicit moment on the way you know Rishi Sunak was asked about this recently and he said no there shouldn't be an apology for the past we have to look forward do you think though that, that a Labour potential Labour government might do it I think that and also I do think you do you think that, they would? But, I, but I also think that the king is moving towards a point where this happens mm -hmm. and one of the things that really struck me yesterday was that when the um, Commonwealth leaders walked down the aisle in the Abbey mm -hmm. it was such a stark reminder at that point about empire and you can't take those two things apart and then as soon as you start to think about empire you think about all the things that happened during empire mm -hmm. and I think it's so entwined in our history mm. that you, and you can't hide from your past. You can't just say, we're all going to move on because that never, ever really works in a relationship until you've dealt with the issues beneath it. Ed, would you support some kind of apology or, or the kind of process they had actually in New Zealand which went through all sorts of different individual events? Well, I, I thought what the New Zealand Prime Minister said was really interesting. I think we could learn from that. Um, I, I agree with Alison and Jason. I think the King is moving towards uh, trying to look at this issue in, in, with greater subtlety than we're seeing from, from the government. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he talks to the heads of state at Commonwealth as, as the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister, because he's the head of state. But with the and, and therefore he will have an answer. It. Well, uh, what we really would back is a much more open minded approach. I mean, you heard from Lucy Fraser that the answer was no. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm afraid we should have a debate about this. Mm -hmm. And in the context of Britain's relations, relationship with the world, with mm -hmm. our Commonwealth partners, but with the rest of the world, I really think just closing the debate down is not the way forward. Well, we're having a bit of that conversation here in the studio this morning. Let's now talk about the politics. So, elections this week, terrible Tory losses. Labour would say that they're on course to win a majority and we'll be talking to Wes Streeting in a few minutes time. But Ed, you said you were like a Cheshire cat the morning after. I mean, really good performance by Lib Dems around the country. What was it, do you think, that meant you were able to turn so many blue areas of the map yellow on Thursday? Well, there are obviously local issues and national issues. So take Stratford-on-Avon, the fact that the Conservatives have reselected Nadim Zahawi mm -hmm. to be a candidate next election went down very, very badly. Mm -hmm. But that backed up with our local campaign on other issues. I, I think what was common across the country, and I was going from, from Hull in uh, the north of England, Greater Manchester, and across the south coast, people were saying time and time again it was the Conservatives' policy on the NHS mm -hmm. and the cost of living. They mm -hmm. feel the Conservatives don't understand what a bad state our NHS is in. They're not helping enough on cost of living, and they felt the government was out of touch. Another big issue, sorry, was on integrity. 
uh, that came up a lot with people feeling that the Conservative Party has lost its way and lifelong Conservatives were switching to us because they don't trust the government anymore. There's always a question though about local success translating yeah. into what happens at yeah. a general election that might still be quite some time away. There are 80 seats where you're second behind the Tories. How many of them now do you think you'll be competitive in? How many are now on your list? Well, more than I thought before uh, last Thursday. So your target um, list will get longer well, then? I, prob almost certainly, almost mm -hmm. certainly. I mean, uh, the, the, what we've shown is that the Liberal Democrats, Liberal Democrats can beat the Conservatives in many parts of the country, that many parts of the country, I've called it the blue wall, mm -hmm. are a fight between the Lib Dems and the Conservatives. And what we've shown is our ability to do that. But what I'm not going to do is take people for granted. We've got to work for those votes. We've got to deserve those votes uh, through our policies and our campaigning and showing that there is a different way. But before these elections, there were suggestions, pretty well sourced suggestions, that the Lib Dems might look to get about 25 or 30 seats at the next general election. Are you now feeling that that ambition can be bolder? Laura, you, you've been doing your job uh, and it worked for the BBC for a long time. You know we wouldn't uh, give a figure on it because that would be is, wrong because it would be taking voters for granted. But is your ambition We're, growing from what you've seen I'm this very week. ambitious for the Liberal Democrats. So, I yes. believe we can uh, win more MPs and we can defeat many Conservative MPs across the country. Well, let's talk about then your relationship with the Conservatives because on this week's uh, numbers, it suggests that Labour would be overwhelmingly the biggest party but wouldn't be able to necessarily govern on their own. It might be a hung parliament. Um, would you, you've clearly ruled out working with the Conservatives under Boris Johnson, but would you consider working with Rishi Sunak in some kind of coalition? No, uh, I spent all my life uh, fighting the Conservatives. Um, and well, you were in coalition with them for five years. Uh, you I, sat around the cabinet yeah, but, table but with Laura, David Cameron. I, and I fought them every day during that period, let me tell you. But, but you, were, um, you were on the same side. You were part uh, of that government. You can fight uh, within a government. It's quite possible, and I did every single day. And I beat them on things like renewable power, where we quadrupled renewable power. But when I became leader uh, mm -hmm. of the party, I made it very clear that my job was to get the Conservatives out of government. Mm -hmm. so but I want to out. beat lots of Conservative MPs. And mm. it, would, it wouldn't be very sensible, would it, having spent all that time defeating Conservative MPs, mm. trying to get them out of government, then to put them back in. Well, politicians not going, sometimes change their well, minds, but you've been very clear you're not, not going to do, do that. that. What about working with the Labour Party? Would you do a coalition deal with Keir Starmer? Well, th that is a hypothetical question because we don't know what's going to happen after... It's a very after, real political uh, question. Well, we don't know well, what's going to happen know. after the next election, as you know. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, as I said just t to one of your questions earlier, we are not going to take the voters for granted. We have got to earn their support to manage to get into a position where there are many more Liberal Democrat uh, MPs in the but next you parliament. Are, but, but you are explicitly ruling out working with the Conservatives. I know you don't want to give 100% clarity, but by implication you are open to working with Labour in some kind of coalition arrangement. No, the focus is on getting rid of Conservative MPs, and uh, I make no, but, no but apology our, for our that. our viewers aren't daft. They can hear you're very happy to say, I've never worked with the Tories, but you don't say that about the Labour Party. So if there were to be a hung parliament, and the Labour government, Keir Starmer gets you on the blower after you chat in Westminster Abbey and says, OK, I need your backing, what would your price be? But listen, that is a hypothetical question. When I'm knocking on doors around the country and I'm talking and listening to people on the NHS and the cost mm. of living on sewage and many, many other issues, they're not bringing that up. They want to know what the Liberal Democrat policies would be. And what I want to do is to win lots of seats, mm -hmm. mainly off the Conservatives, some off the SNP, mm -hmm. and then you'll have lots of Liberal Democrat MPs able to push forward Liberal Democrat policies, but, what whatever those, but, the combination and, of the next parliament. And whatever the combination might be, the Liberal Democrats have previously, we've had an understanding from your party that the price of working with Labour would be proportional representation, a change to the electoral system. Is that still the case? Well, we're going to have a manifesto at the next election. There'll be a whole set of policies on the NHS, uh, on the environment, on police, on education, on the economy. And yes, electoral reform is very important for the Liberal Democrats. I've made that clear time and time again. I think our current system fails the voters. It doesn't put the voters in control of politics. That's so wrong. So I want to make sure... situation, PR would have to be on the table. PR is absolutely on the table for the Liberal Democrats. Of course it is. It has okay. been for years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm determined to try to make sure our democracy is fairer to people and more representative. OK. And just before we close, I have to show our viewers a selection of your stunts on the campaign trail. You look like you're having really? a great time. <laughs> and your stunt this week was a giant clock. You had the tractor. You've had the blue wall. Here we are, starting with the blue wall. That I'm seems like another I'm time. I'm making a point. <laughs> 
time ago. Here was your tractor. Yeah. Is that your favourite one? Probably, actually. The tractor yeah. was the favourite. And I this, did like but the here clock. you were on Friday. So I wonder the what's did, next. The cuckoo didn't come out quite much. But oh, was there a cuckoo meant to pop was, out of the clock? There was. We got the confetti. <laughs> we got the TikTok. And we, I think we made the, clear, the point clear. The time is up for Rishi Sunak. OK, Ed Davies, thank you very much for now. Whatever next. Well, take a look at this. the new leader of Medway Council in Kent, Vince Maple. A victory lap around the leisure centre, it looks like. Just one of the places around England where Labour broke through, winning more than 500 extra council seats on Thursday night, which Keir Starmer claims puts Labour on its way to a majority government. West Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, is here, looking as chipper as Ed Davies. Well, how could of... you not be after seeing... Um, <laughs> look, Vince Maple, uh, I mean, that, that speaks to so many other um, Labour councillors and campaigners, but you know, Vince has been absolutely embedded in Medway for years, really committed to his communities, will be a brilliant council leader, and that I think that joy you saw there reflects uh, results right across England, actually, where Labour has made gains in places that uh, people didn't expect us to four years ago and perhaps even we didn't expect to even as the results were coming in on Thursday. In Hartlepool for example where we thought it might take another cycle for mm -hmm. Labour to win mm -hmm. a majority on Hartlepool Council we came within two votes of a majority so whether it's in the south of England whether it's in uh, the north of England right across England in places where we need to win to form a majority Labour is winning back support and we're confident we can win a majority at the next election but not complacent and that's a message I want to get across to your viewers we're not taking people for granted we're going to work hard for but that's an interesting thing isn't it because Keir Starmer very clearly used the moment of success on Friday to say we are on our way to a majority now that's actually not quite what the numbers suggest and your share of the vote actually was exactly the same as it was last year what we have relearned as a party as we've recovered from our worst defeat since 1935 is that you've got to work hard to win people's trust mm -hmm. and support and where you clock up the results matters we were ruthlessly focused on those areas that Labour needs to win in order to form majority at the next general election we saw breakthrough results right across England and of course we didn't have elections this time in Scotland and Wales where in Scotland mm -hmm. we are very much back in contention mm -hmm. not just as a potential large force in Westminster mm -hmm. but with the SNP implosion people are increasingly looking to Scottish Labour and Anas Sawa mm -hmm. as an alternative government in Scotland but as well. why do you say you're confident you can get a majority when the numbers actually don't show that they show you've made great progress but they don't show that you can be confident of majority the Tories have had a shocking year and your share of the vote didn't change. Laura, uh, I honestly think we could be sat here on election night mm -hmm. or the morning after, Keir Starmer could be on his way to Downing Street as the Prime Minister of a new Labour majority government mm -hmm. and the Conservative talking points would still be disappointing night for the Wait, Conservatives but is, Labour could have not, done better, come not, on. This is not a Conservative talking point. The fact is your share of the vote didn't shift. Now, you had good progress, I'm not disputing that for a single second, but independent experts like John Curtis and others say clearly the numbers don't mean you can be confident of a majority, well, just, and that's what you're telling the public. Mind, Thursday night's local election results were exactly that, local election results, not a prediction of the next general election. And in some places, for example, where some of the smaller parties did well in local government, even by their own admission, those seats would likely be Labour at a general election because people do vote differently locally and nationally. And one of the reasons I'm confident mm. about Labour's ability to win the next general election is on two fronts. One, I spoke to a number of voters uh, in recent weeks. I was up in the North East, the East, East Mid, South Yorkshire, in those marginal constituencies. And I found undecided voters who weren't yet with us on Thursday, but are saying, I'm thinking about Labour for the next general election. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, is for the Labour Party, the best is yet to come. Keir Starmer setting out a big mission on health later this month, not just to cut NHS uh, waiting times, which are appalling, but to build an NHS that's fit for the future. That will be shortly followed by our big mission to tackle the gap in opportunities for kids from working class backgrounds like mine and those from the, from the more affluent backgrounds. And of course, we've got our conference to come. We've got our manifesto yeah. to come. The best is yet to come. And, hope, and that's why we can win the next and, general election. And you hope that you will and you hope it will continue to build. But as things stand, 
you know that people wonder about what might happen if you're the biggest party, but you don't actually get into government, you don't have a majority. And we were just talking to Ed Davey about that, whether or not he would work with a Labour government in order to help them have enough seats in the House of Commons. Now, would you be open to a coalition with the Lib Dems? Well, I know the Conservative Party would love us to be talking about whether or not there will be a coalition after the next general election, because bizarrely, their reaction to the election results was, well, we didn't just lose seats to Labour, we lost seats to everyone, as if that was some sort of achievement. But it's a legitimate uh, question, because as we've been discussing on the numbers this week, you can't be sure that you would be in majority. We, we are, so would you be open to a coalition we, we with the think, Lib Dems? We think we can win a majority. People wouldn't have said that after the last general election. That's what we're working towards, that's what we're fighting for. And I think people can go confidently to the polls at the next general election, knowing that a Labour government is possible and within our grasp. And as for the Liberal Democrats, I don't think Edward would mind me saying that the reason that David Cameron got a majority in 2015 was because he went around and hoovered up a whole load of seats in the south of England where they are Lib Dem versus Conservative races. A so a Lib Dem recovery Lib in those areas isn't somehow a risk to a Labour majority, it is a path to a Labour majority. But would you rule and of course, out uh, only Lib Labour can win a majority, that's what we're working to. Mm -hmm. And whether it's in Scotland where Anna Sawa is leading the recovery, whether it's across the UK, and, and Labour can already, win a general but, election. But my question, and people legitimately will be interested in your answer to this, would you rule out a coalition with the Lib Dems? Um, we're, not, we're just not in that ballpark of talking about coalition governments. What we are talking about, which is why we did well, cutting the cost of living, cutting NHS waiting lists, cutting crime with policies that saw people come to Labour mm -hmm. on Thursday night and more policies mm -hmm. still to come to convince people that, yes, Labour can be trusted with the economy, with law and order and national security, the issues that cost us votes at previous elections. We can also be trusted to rebuild our public services and give people hope back. Like the woman I met in Man the other day mm -hmm. who is waiting 18 months mm. for a hip operation at the same time she's um, going out working full-time and told mm -hmm. me that she hasn't got enough money to even do the shopping in the supermarket she works in on a 10% discount Rishi Sunak doesn't understand the lives of people mm. like hers let alone offer an alternative is, that's why Labour is, is the, going to be the party of government after the next general election if the, we're working hard and not complacent to be the party of government though it is possible that you might need help from another party would you ever offer the Lib Dems proportional representation I don't think proportional representation will be in Labour's manifesto, would be my prediction. I think Keir's been clear about that as well. We've got more work to do uh, on our manifesto, which will be published closer to the election. But people can already see whether it's the windfall tax on big oil and gas companies to lower people's bills, whether it's the biggest expansion of NHS staff in history funded by abolishing the non-DOM tax status, whether it's 13,000 more police officers on the streets in neighbourhoods. Labour's got the policies that speak to the priorities of the country. Rishi Sunak had nothing to say and hasn't even had the decency and humility to apologise for being so out of touch well, and, and that's, failing and so that's many a question people. for him, not a question for you. Um, Ed, I know you've been listening intently. It doesn't sound like proportional representation is going to get into the Labour manifesto. What do you say to that? Well, it's up to the Labour Party. Uh, it'll be in the Liberal Democrat manifesto and we'll be putting forward very ambitious policies, particularly on the health service, the economy, the environment, local policing. Uh, we'll have a fascinating uh, manifesto and I'm really looking forward to putting it to the people. Goodness me, I didn't imagine we ended up talking about manifestos so much this morning, but there we go. Um, I want to talk to you also about the protests yesterday yeah. at the coronation. Now, it was an event that lots of people clearly enjoyed massively, but there were what appeared to be some peaceful protests where arrests did take place. Are you comfortable with what you know from what we saw yesterday, or do you think that there are some questions about how it was handled? Well, I, I, one thing that I do feel reassured about this morning is that the Metropolitan Police and their new commissioner, uh, Mark Rowley, know that there is a gap at the moment in terms of public confidence in policing, and the Met Police in particular, uh, and, and where the Met would want to be. And they are explaining and, and, and justifying mm -hmm. why they made arrests in some cases yesterday. Now, I think we'll wait and see. These are potentially still ongoing investigations, mm. so I shouldn't comment on individual cases. We'll wait and see whether they got that balance right, but the accountability piece in this is, in, is important. It's also important to acknowledge that, you know, while most of us yesterday were celebrating, uh, I thought it was a, an amazing day, mm -hmm. people pat the mall, pat the Abbey, and lots of street parties in my constituency over the course of the next couple of days. There were also people protesting in mm -hmm. Trafalgar Square for Republic. It's a legitimate view, not one I agree with, mm -hmm. but I thought actually that shows our democracy at its best, that you know, people can disagree and disagree well, I hope, 
um, and I think it's for the Met to explain the arrests uh, and, and make sure they've got the balance right. And as we've like seen, if they, didn't, if, they didn't get it, if they didn't get it right, um, you know, I think the Casey review demonstrates it's important to hold your hands up, but we'll wait and see. And we're almost out of time, but I just want to ask you briefly, we've talked a lot about the idea of reparations or potentially an apology for some of the things um, that happened during Empire from the royal family or potentially for the government. Would Labour do that if you win the next election? Well, I think in terms of an apology, Tony Blair apologised back in 2007 Indeed, yeah. when he was Prime Minister. I think in terms of... Well, I think I'll say a couple of things briefly. One is that we've got to view British history in the round, the, the highs, the lows and, and the in-betweens. I don't think it makes us... Um, we shouldn't be on the defensive about our, our, our record on empire. We should just be honest and open about the terrible injustices uh, of, of... But also, let's more importantly look to the future. From my own perspective, I think it's outrageous that black women are four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. I think it's appalling, actually, that the gap is there in terms of people from the richest and poorest backgrounds as well, two and a half times more likely to die if you're so a poor woman than the wealthy woman. Focus on the future. Let's tackle the health inequalities, the educational disadvantage and, and the class barriers in our society that hold but people from working class backgrounds back and often people from ethnic minorities a double disadvantage. Let's look to the future and build a fair, more just, more equal society. That's what Labour stands for. That's our record. OK, Wes Street saying always great to have you with us in Thanks the studio. Thanks for coming in. Now, it's nearly 10 o'clock, believe it or not. And remember, we started this morning asking what comes next for our political parties after the elections on Thursday. We absolutely need to reflect. I think Rishi's only been the Prime Minister for six months. And I think yeah, it's not five minutes, it's six months. It's not five minutes, seven. but these are huge challenges, Laura. They are challenges that countries are facing internationally. Labour is winning back support. And we're confident we can win a majority at the next election, but not complacent. OK, feels like we're already in the general election, doesn't it? Goodness me, final word to our panel. Alison, in your view, what does come next from our political parties? I mean, I sort of feel we've really had a flavour for it this morning. Rishi Sunat seemed like, keep your head down, carry on, let's hope it might be OK, and Labour just increasingly bullish. Yeah, I think Rishi Sunak's plan is that the further away he gets from the car crash of Johnson and Trust, that, that he might be able to gain ground with people who lost faith during that period. Um, and I think from Labour, it's, it's interesting. There's been... But I think we're still waiting to see the stardust, and maybe that's to come. Interesting. Jason, what do you think's next? Yeah, I think what the Tory party have demonstrated is that they're continuously out of touch with what people are suffering at the moment in terms of cost of living crisis. But I do think that that's not a reason for people to kind of make profound judgments on what may happen in the next general election. I think complacency is the thing that could potentially cost Labour, and hopefully it won't. And a year is a lifetime, a century in politics. Final word to you, Ed. Ed. Well, it's really clear that people are fed up with the Conservatives uh, for all their policies. I think it's uh, now the responsibility of the Liberal Democrats mm -hmm. and other parties mm -hmm. to put forward their positive case. Mm -hmm. what, what are the things? Make it clear that people understand all what we stand for, our, uh, I think, our great policies. And hopefully when they do, we can do even better. It does feel like we're already in the election, even though it is a century away in political <laughs> years. All three of you, thank, thank you so much for being with thank us you. this morning. Jason Arday, Alison Phillips and Sir Edward Davey, who's got the biggest smile in politics this weekend. This week, Rishi Sunak's hope that keeping calm and carrying on would appeal has been confronted by the reality that, right now at least, voters, lots of you, want to punish his party. Shaking that mood in time for a general election is not impossible, but it's a tall order after 13 years in charge. But clearly, Labour sense victory. Yet it still has a task to persuade you it deserves enough of your support to get into government on its own. But enough of sketching out the future. Thank you so much for your company, and you can, of course, catch up on iPlayer. But let's close this morning with a final look at a day of history, King Charles III's coronation. Goodbye.